They both ex- they both said that they would um, be here. It looks like Billy's just calling in now. And it takes a little bit once you log in and to get the volume on and everything else. One thing I want to mention before we get started, um, just to help uh, Miranda administer this. When you are not talking, if you can mute your microphones, it really helps. There's a lot of noise that comes off the microphones, and it's a real challenge for the recording and to try to hear the recording clearly, and she's recording off of her cell phone. So um, so if I, I, um, these, these minutes are obviously not going to be super long given the content of our agenda, but uh, just a reminder, a little housekeeping for folks to try to mute their mics and be aware of that, of any extraneous noise. Thank you. And Chair Cornell, we have a, a quorum. So if you want to get started. I, I will. That's a call me in order. Please take the roll. Okay. Planning commission meetings. Are we, re- are we ready, Miranda? Yep. Okay. Planning commission meeting is called to order on June 24th, 2020 at 7.02 p.m. Roll call, Chair Cornell. Chair. Vice Chair Williams. Here. Commissioner Blakemore. Here. Commissioner Giblin. Here. Commissioner Glasser. Here. Commissioner Pere. Here. I think I heard that. Yeah, Commission- <laughs> Commissioner Reed. Here. Present. Thank you. And uh, Trustee Liaison Taylor? Here. Excellent. Great. And please note for the record that at present, Commissioner Herring has not uh, logged in yet for this meeting. Hey, this is Stephanie. I'm on the phone. Oh, and uh, she's I'm here. I get my WebEx to work. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks. We have a full board. Yeah. Woohoo! After all, the uh, first item is the approval of the minutes from May 27, 2020. Uh, they certainly, I didn't find anything. Does anybody find any issues or have any additions or deletions to make? Not, uh, we might have to make sure who is here so everybody can vote. Um, certainly, uh, Karen and Julian um, would abstain. So, a motion to approve the minutes from May 27th. So moved. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. Okay. And Chris Perre also made the motion, so he can be your second. Okay. <laughs> okay, sounds good. So that was uh, Vice Chair Williams? Yes. And then uh, Commissioner Perre with the second. Okay. And then uh, a roll call. Uh, so we have abstentions from Commissioner Blakemore, who was not yet on the commission, and uh, uh, Julian Taylor, who was absent for the last meeting. But for those who attended Chair Cornell, approval of minutes? Approved. Approved, yes. <laughs> Commissioner Giblin? Approved. Commissioner Glasser? Yes, approved. Commissioner Herring? Yes, approved. Commissioner Perret? Yes. Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. And Vice Chair Williams? Yes. Awesome. Motion okay. passes. Fantastic. Next order of business is public comment. Is there anybody else on the line who would like to speak um, about any issue? I guess there's no agenda item or no hearing items tonight. Okay, I don't see anybody. Does Stop, you see anybody? Has all gone? No, you do not have any other public members on the call. Okay, uh, then we'll just go to information items, which would be the staff report. So, staff, who sure. to the staff report? Sure, I can go ahead and start, and then I'll turn it over to Miranda. So, this is Karen. Hi, everybody. Um, this month, for staff accolades, we want to recognize Nicole 
Fernandinson. She runs our utilities department and team. She's been with the town for eight years. She is just an amazing leader with her crew. She is a positive, bright light. She uh, went above and beyond uh, when planning for her maternity leave, which she is on right now because she just gave birth to Calvin on Monday. But we want to recognize her for her um, steadfast approach to issues in town. And even when she was eight, nine months pregnant, she was down in the in the muddy waters, muddy cold waters, dealing with things like uh, broken water lines. So we wish her the very best as she begins uh, this great adventure of motherhood. For COVID-19, um, Things have been changing very quickly in regards to the orders coming out of the state. And then also, I'm, I'm not sure what to do here. Okay, I'm also uh, managing the screen right now. So, sorry, I, I'm not sure what I just agreed to do there. Stephanie was asking to annotate. Uh, anyways, um, the uh, safer at home orders were changed and restrictions lifted on some of the businesses such as bars, which have been allowed to open now with restrictions. We continue to follow this information. Uh, Miranda has been working really closely with the businesses as these laws are changing to make sure that uh, businesses can open and are prepared to open and can, um, you know, address social distancing and sanitation and things like that that are required. The next phase will be protect our neighbors. And the way that's going to work is that the public health, uh, the public health organizations for each community will determine when they're ready to shift into that. And because of the recent uptick in cases in Boulder County, we probably will not see a shift to um, protect our neighbors too soon, but um, Boulder Co County Public Health continues to to monitor and track that. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, okay, so the guidelines have already been finished, so we don't need to address that. The Resiliency and Recovery Team continues to work with individuals and organizations and businesses to help them understand how they can operate or provide gatherings and th things like that and still abide by the um, by the order. I'll let uh, Miranda talk about, you know, opening of town facilities in just a bit. As far as how we're doing financially, uh, the town is, um, you know, we've seen quite a drop in our revenue for earned income, but our tax revenue is actually doing okay. We're uh, eager to see how um, May comes out. We get our revenue two, week, two months in arrears. So uh, we're hesitantly optimistic that we might have fared better than some communities. Again, we look at the total revenue picture, which includes the earned as well as our taxes, and we'll be eager to see how our um, property tax revenue pans out in June, since I'm sure you're all aware that the state has, um, has issued, they were strongly encouraging all the counties to not require that property taxes be paid on time, and that if they're late, to charge no fee. And of course, the Boulder County uh, did enact that. And so, you know, we're, we're interested to see how that all pans out. But for now, the town is doing okay. You know, we did come up with those contingency budgets, which we're operating under. We have um, still got several open positions that will remain vacant. We did fill one of the vacant police officer positions, and we have a new officer who will begin on or around July 1st. We also turned one part-time position into full-time in public works since, um, of course, this is their go time. And we're getting a lot of uh, work done. Um, public works is hard at it right now, improving roads and the parks and whatnot. Other good news had to do with the uh, CARES Act it expanding to include municipalities and small communities. In the past, the CARES Act was only um, 
eligible for uh, communities with 500,000 or more people, and now that has changed. So Miranda and I have been working with the county. Part of the requirement of having access to these funds is that the county has to agree on how those funds will be allocated. And I'm I'm happy to say we're very, very close to signing an agreement where uh, the county and the municipalities within the county have agreed on a split where um, basically Netherland would get a portion of the funds based on our um, population. And we'll keep you up to date on that as well. And the good news too is that uh, the DDA, because it's a special tax district, it also has access to a different pot of money through CARES that is specific to um, special tax districts. I also wanted to mention that the United States Forest Service has revised their camping regulations. And now um, camping, you, you can camp within you can't camp within any location within the same 20 mile radius for more than 14 days with any continuous 30 day period and they're kind of, they're hoping that this will because we're in the middle of a pandemic will address um, some of the issues faced when we would have encampments both um, in the structured campsites but also dispersed that could go on for quite some time at places like West Mag that can lead to a buildup of trash and human waste and things like that which of course accelerates something like the spread of coronavirus. I did attach the community development report so you could see where we're at with safe built and even though the numbers show a drop in inspections permit activity and plan reviews as compared to last year. The planning department is really busy processing applications and offering uh, virtual and in-person meetings. I'm sure you all are aware that uh, RTD is going to begin uh, onboarding again at the front of the bus, which it had stopped doing because of COVID-19. Uh, but come July 1st, the plan is to begin onboarding again at the front and taking fares again because they weren't doing that. It, people were actually being allowed to ride on it for free just for safety so that they weren't exchanging money or cards or that type of thing. I also provided an update on CDOT and the work going on in the canyon. Again, you're probably all aware of what's going on. Um, they are doing blasting again and there are four hour closure periods, although they're trying to limit it to just several days a month as opposed to several days a week. And then you've probably seen the work going on around the roundabout uh, uh, in Netherland. The work they're doing is to basically realign the pedestrian walk, and uh, that is due to be done in the next week or two. I also wanted to mention that the Hesse Trail shuttle is going to begin operating again, uh, but they will not be operating out of the RTD park and ride. They did hear loud and clear the concerns the town had about them taking up all that parking in the RTD and then having it spill over into the business district as well and um, how the town was just basically becoming a parking lot in the summer. And so they're going to be operating out of the high school. They're going to do it in a um, kind of a trial period. Uh, they might actually be starting that Wednesday this week because they wanted to get it up and running before July 4th weekend. They want to see if they can actually operate it safely. They are going to restrict how many people can get on the shuttles and, of course, be cleaning them you know, often and in between. Uh, there's also information about um, some of the work that Public Works has been doing. Also, town, town staff, the cleanup day, we did have a meeting today and we have settled on August 1st. Um, and uh, we are, you know, planning it to be a safe event. We're considering how we can make sure that uh, the way the traffic flows, the number of calls that come in, so on and so forth is handled in a safe way as you guys know it's one of the um you know one of our best days in the town because it really does result in a lot of cleanup a lot of fire mitigation uh recycling um you know a lot of good things that happen out of that uh, miranda do you want to talk about the updates to the facilities and uh the rest of the report yes 
Um, so for town hall, we are um, now open more. We are open on Wednesdays and Fridays. And then starting next week, we'll be open Monday, Wednesday, Friday, with the exception of July 3rd, because that is the ho the observed holiday. But we are open more to the public, which is helpful. We do have a, a barrier uh, for the front desk, um, a barrier guard. Uh, and we also ask that all people wear masks when they enter in the lobby, but we're glad to see people more. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, people can still make appointments by calling Town Hall. We have two openings at Town Hall. Um, we did a post for our administrative assistant position, and those applications are due on um, Friday. And then also Jen Hagee, who is our town treasurer, did submit her resignation as well um, and is sadly leaving us and will be um, th with us through the end of July, but we have also posted for her position. Uh, the DDA SAP gap funding, which was that $100,000 that was given out to businesses, so far 36 businesses have received their full award amount of a little over $2,000. Um, there was a total of, of over 40 who received the funds, so we're working with the rest of them to get in their information so we can award them their money to be used for things like property taxes, mortgages, rent, PPE, stuff like that. Uh, we do have two vacancies on boards. Currently, the Downtown Development Authority is looking for one board member. Um, those applications are due July 1st. And then the Sustainability Advisory Board was looking for a member, but we did receive an application from Laura King. And she uh, that application will go before the board on July 7th. We, there was an ordinance passed on June 2nd, Ordinance 809, which granted me authority to issue temporary use permits um, and temporary license agreements to allow businesses to expand outside their regular footprint. So you may see that around town that there are other businesses who have expanded into potentially town right of way or into their own parking to allow for outdoor seating. There is a limitation in terms of indoor-outdoor seating. For indoor, businesses are limited to 50 people or 50% of their occupancy, whichever is the lesser. But by opening up the outdoor spaces, it does increase their ability to serve more people because there is not a limit there. You just have to make sure your tables are six feet apart. We also passed a waste hauler reporting resolution at that meeting, which would require waste haulers to report their annual data to Boulder County. Um, we're one of the only municipalities that doesn't require that right now, so this would just kind of add in and it'll help us get a better understanding of how much waste is being taken out of Netherland. The board also declared July 25th to be High School Graduate Recognition Day, where they will have recognized the seniors from Chinook and Nederland High School. Um, what they, the mayor is going to write a letter, and also in this proclamation, he names every uh, student who is graduating. So we're looking forward to celebrating with them in about a month. We also passed a Black Lives Matter resolution. Um, this was written by Trustee Coombs Ismail, um, and it really just focused on recognizing that Nederland has an opportunity to address um, and take meaningful action towards the struggle of black liberation. And then lastly, June is uh, Pride Month, so the mayor did read a proclamation, and there is a rainbow flag hanging outside of Town Hall, just in recognition of, of the LGBTQ plus community. And that's it. Questions? <coughs> okay. You're on. Yeah. Um, but I, we'll just right get to the discussion items. And so <coughs> Chris came here and the staff has the agenda item for the uh, transportation improvement program. So I guess, Chris, you have the floor. Okay. Yeah, I'm Gary. Can you hear me? Is there uh, somebody that's going to manage my um, PowerPoint? Is that Miranda or Karen? It's, it's Karen. So do you want her that's to go me. there? That's me, Chris. Do you want me to go there now or do you want to stay on the AIM or should I go there to the PowerPoint? Uh, go straight to the PowerPoint, please. Okie dokie. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right, so um, thank you, 
planning commission tonight uh, for listening to this presentation. I wanted to um, update the, the commission on a program that, or a project rather, that uh, town staff has been working on for quite some time. We were awarded some um, some funds, quite a bit, $1.5 million for a project um, that staff came up with. And so um, I wanted to bring this project to the attention of the, the commission and hopefully get some feedback from you guys on on aspects of the project. So um, what is TIP? Again, it's Transportation Improvement Program. It's a program, it's a mix of federal and state dollars. Um, the grant is administered through Dr. Cog. And Dr. Cog stands for Denver Regional Council of Governments. One of the oldest council of governments in the country. It's comp comprised of over 50 municipalities. It's, um, Nederland is a member of the, uh, of this, this group. As you can see, uh, to the right there, that's the, the area that Dr. Cog um, comprises of, and obviously Netherlands is within Boulder there to the north, and it is essentially the most populated area of Colorado, otherwise known as the Front Range. And then the TIP grants are managed by the Department of um, the Colorado Department of Transportation. So Dr. Cog has a plan. It's called the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. And um, the goals of this plan are to reduce single occupancy vehicles. Some of the goals, I might add. It's actually a comprehensive plan. Um, and I didn't include it in your report tonight, but feel free to look it up. Uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite an ambitious plan. Um, another goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce congestion, in the region and traffic, increase alternative transportation, improve ADA accessibility, promote public transportation, promote economic vitality, and all in all, um, improve regional connectivity. Okay, next slide, please. Karen. Next slide, please. So uh, Dr. Cog divides these funds into sub-regions and Netherlands sub-region consisted of communities within Boulder County, such as Longmont or Broomfield, Superior, City of Boulder, Boulder County, and so forth. Large communities. Um, the communities within these subregions submit their projects to meet the Metro Vision Plan goals. And these projects are scored by technical committees, which are members from each community that um, score each project. And, and Karen and myself were a part of these technical committees and attended multiple meetings to help score these projects. There was $23 million available to, um, to our region. Um, sounds like a lot of money, but some of these planning projects are, are quite expensive. And just to put into perspective, the city of Boulder had about $30 million worth of, of projects on the shelf. Projects like um, a pedestrian under or overpass can be pretty expensive down in the city. So um, Netherlands competed with a lot of, a lot of large uh, municipalities for this funding. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, this was the project that Netherlands um, conceived to help align with these funding. Um, we decided to look at areas in Netherlands that we thought would best align with the various plans um, and planning documents that Nederland has. We also want to look at some of the, the areas that are in, in need of, of help and um, want to have most impact within town. 
while also again aligning with the goals of the plan and meeting the the criteria of the grant. And so as you see here, and as I mentioned earlier, um, connectivity within the region was a pretty important goal of this funding. So um, Netherlands create, came up with this plan. You see in purple there um, is a sidewalk. Netherlands uh, proposed to install a multimodal sidewalk that connects with the RTD parking ride, which kind of um, touches upon that regional connectivity. We also show there the Boulder County affordable housing because we wanted to show um, uh, our connection with uh, affordable housing within the community and promote walkability. Um, also, um, connectivity with the town's central main uh, municipal operations, the town hall. Um, this is also the heart of downtown. So it was important for economic vitality to address this area of town. And also, um, the staff wanted to partner with the DDA, which this obviously is right in the center of their district. Um, also within this project, is um, electric charging stations and to promote that alternative transportation piece and improve emissions along the front range. Um, bicycle corrals that would promote um, bicycling within the community into the RTD parking ride to reduce cars and traffic um, and ADA accessibility by having a multimodal sidewalk and as you know, that can be challenging for um, disabled folks within the community. So for all those reasons, we chose this project. And this is our sort of conceptual of, of the project. Okay, next, next slide, please. So um, I wanted to show how this aligned with Netherlands existing plans, because we did consider not only the the regional transportation plan from Dr. Cog, but also the plans within Netherlands' own community and planning documents that have been created over the last 10 years. And so um, this project aligns with the master infrastructure plan from 2014, Netherlands' comprehensive plan from 2013. And by the way, um, within Netherlands' comprehensive plan, the, the MVTP, the Denver Regional Transportation Plan, was adopted within that comprehensive plan. And then again, the DDA Master Plan um, to partner with the DDA. And as I said, this is in the heart of their district and is very impactful and is a major, potentially a major improvement within the downtown district. And hopefully... Um, spur economic vitality um, within the area. And then um, Netherland Area tra uh, Trails Master Plan and the um, Parks and Recreation and Open Space Plan um, make mention of walkability within the community and trails, obviously a sidewalk. And then um, Netherland's Housing Needs Assessment. This is why we show uh, the affordable housing unit there. And within that assessment from 2014, walkability and walking to work and that kind of thing was an important aspect to um, making Netherland more affordable. And then um, in 2017, we had a road assessment. And as you guys know, um, Jefferson Street is in, um, has been in dire needs for, for many years and it is better now, as you probably noticed, um, but still the entire area could use a lot of improvement and updating as it's deteriorated, deteriorated quite a bit over the years. And then um, as an aside, the road improvement sales tax funds that were passed a couple years ago, and it's these funds that we use to leverage in order to get this larger amount of $1.5 million. Excuse me. Um, next plan, next slide, please. So, um, this, uh, this presentation is sort of recycled for, um, for the various boards that I've presented. 
over the past couple of months, and um, I've presented to SAB and ProSAB and the DDA and, and the BOT on this project, and now I'm here tonight in front of you guys to um, get further feedback and input on this project as we plan and design the project prior to getting public feedback on it. So I want to bring this to the decision makers. So again, April 4th, uh, two years ago in 2018, sales tax was passed, and this was put in here just to show that um, we are using these funds to help leverage those dollars to acquire larger amount of money to do these projects because they're quite expensive. Um, and again, the amount of money that is collected from the sales tax on an annual basis, it's around $90,000 or so. And staff is using roughly 50,000 of that, um, leveraging that for, for this, uh, these grant funds that we've been awarded. And since December of uh, 31st of, of that year in 2018, an abstract of the project um, submitted to the technical committee. February of 2019, um, the application, DDA approved staff's application for TIP project. So um, this is the first time we brought this before the DDA and they were on board. We also asked for an additional amount of funding of $69,000 from them to help with the reconstruction of the road. And so these grant dollars are very rigid and they don't apply to all forms of, of reconstruction. So we needed a little bit of extra money from the DDA. Then um, that same month, the BOT approved the application for funding um, uh, or rather, uh, to submit the application of staff's conceptual. In May, the D DDA voted to approve an additional $70,000 on top of that 69000 for more reconstruction of the visitor center parking lot. We'd like to repave that area. And again, um, Jefferson Street, it's very expensive to, to pave. And, um, and that's really, believe it or not, a drop in the bucket when it comes to those kinds of projects. September of 2019, the project was awarded $1.5 million. In February, the BOT approved... Can I just say that that was my birthday, September 4th, 2019. I just want to mention that. It was my birthday. Happy belated <laughs> birthday. No, just it was fun because we got awarded, you know. Um, in February, the BOT um, approved an IGA with CDOT. Again, they managed the, the funds, and they have a very structured and rigid process and criteria, so it can be very difficult to jump through their hoops. And on the 21st of this year, um, they approved an on-call engineering contract with JVA, and that um, is there just to let you know that... Uh, to meet CDOT's rigid criteria, we have to go through a process and only certain, if you don't follow that process, your engineers won't be allowed to engineer the project or design it. So we've made it through that process and now we have the engineers in place that um, meet and fit the criteria to move forward with design. Okay, next uh, slide. Next step. Um, all right, so like I said, this is sort of a uh, uh, a recycled presentation, but the BOT has already approved a task order um, for, to uh, to contract with our on-call engineers. And then part of their task order is to create an, an OPR, an owner's project requirements, which is one of the reasons why I'm talking to you tonight to get feedback on this project and I'm not looking for um, feedback all tonight. I'll take whatever you, you have. However, um, you can email me. I will say though, it's probably more uh, proper to, to email um, Chairperson Roger Cornell and be collective in your um, 
and your ass for uh, things to be added to the OPR. Um, the OPR acts as a guiding document to ensure the town's priorities and values are met within the project as we move forward. And then staff will work with each board to ensure that these priorities are incorporated within the project prior to BOT approval. And um, again, I've met with SAB to get a feedback, ProSAP um, with you, um, the DDA, and, um, and I'll be going back and forth to the BT, BOT quite a bit, I'm sure, over the next years. Um, next slide. That might be it. Yeah, so again, this side, slide doesn't really apply um, in this presentation. And so um, that, that essentially concludes my, my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions about this project. And um, I think that's it. Thank you, Chris. Um, Karen, or do you have anything to follow up on that presentation? Very thorough. I know it was great. I do wonder just, uh, Chris, are you looking for specific feedback on the OPR? And if so, have you shared that with everyone already? No, the OPR hasn't been created. And okay. it is not even in draft. It's actually in draft form on my desktop. Let me let me back up. In partial draft form on my desktop. <laughs> <laughs> so, so really, what you're doing is introducing the project again, which I know we have presented to the um, uh, to the planning commission, but it's been a couple years ago. I think it was when we were writing the grant. Um, so. It, this is just a refresher to reintroduce the project and then just to give a heads up then that the OPR will be coming to them. And will you be sending that electronically to the whole planning commission and then presenting again at another meeting? Yes. Okay, it's great. It's kind of a drawn out process. So as much feedback as I can get early on would be appreciated. Um, as I said, the it's a drawn out process with CDOT and um, you do have to jump through a lot of hoops. So it does take time. Um, this is one of the tasks of our on-call engineers to help create this OPR and make sure that um, the priorities of the various boards are incorporated into it. And so as much feedback as I can get from you guys would be appreciated um, from a planning perspective. I will add that, you know, as we look at this downtown area and start adding sidewalks and thinking about traffic flow, for example, we may want to change how the flow of traffic goes in this area. I mean, a two-way traffic on Jefferson Street can be, can be tight. Maybe that could be changed. Also, you know, a consideration is parking along 1st Street maybe potentially reclaiming some of the town's right-of-way and adding parking to the south side of 1st Street could be really beneficial. So those are just some ideas um, that I'm throwing out there as we start thinking about conceptuals. But, um, so, yeah, uh, that's what I'm looking for is just sort of feedback on this concept of put together an OPR, a draft, and then that will go to each board for consideration. Well, and, and the other thing I just want to mention is that it's not as if we can really change the project now that uh, CDOT and Dr. Cog have agreed to fund it. Uh, but uh, that being said, how we address these improvements can definitely take input. So it's not as if we could decide we're going to improve some other road or, 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 or what have you. Um, it has to stay within the concept that's been approved through the grant process. But then how do we get there will be the conversation that we'll be bringing back to you. Yes, thank you. It is very rigid. It is very rigid. We we went through 18 months of going to meetings, um, yeah, to understand fully all, all the restrictions. Okay, well... Let me just jump in. I'm going to be very brief, and then we'll just go down the list of all the 
uh, any commissioners, and if you have thought about this, have some suggestions, ideas, questions, we will do that. Uh, don't, don't, don't address these right now, Chris, but at the end, I, I would like to, you, you address the, uh, you know, the multi mobile. I mean, are we talking concrete sidewalks here or, you know, maybe talk about the, uh, the material, but let's just say that that would be my biggest question. But we certainly have the plan of where it's going to be. Um, so I, that was the biggest one I had just about what was the material going to be. But let's just go down the line first of all. So I forgot Jim last month. So Jim, would you like to start this month's question and answers about the OPR? So Chris, uh, I was curious, if, so is the total amount of money that's going to be spent on the purple sidewalks, the, the, the step that's outlined in purple, those improvements, that's going to be $1.5 million, uh, is that right? Yes, in addition to um, electric charging stations and various crosswalks, the, the bike corrals that we're proposing, um, but the gist of it is all for the actual these multimodal connection and connectivity. So yes, for the most part, that 1.5 million will be devoted to that. Now there is a thought that we could bury some overhead utilities that exist on First Street. Um, I have a desire to do that. I'm not sure how that's going to fit within the funding. I know Kathmandu in their reconstruction of their building has got some issues around um, the existing telephone wires. So we will be looking at that too as we um, improve this area and maybe we could um, address that as we move through this process. And on the existing sidewalks that you, uh, you show here in light blue, uh, will there be any improvement on some of that? I think the stuff that runs in front of the church is that uh, sand-based material. There will not be. However, a portion of Jefferson Street will likely be reconstructed um, along, you know, up to Highway 72, probably be reconstructed to fit the criteria and the specifications of what a multimodal sidewalk is. I don't think that in particular is multimodal, um, but no, we don't have plans through this um, funding to address those uh, sand sidewalks. So it's all pretty well what you have listed here in the purple uh, and the, and the exit and the, the new bike stations and charging stations, all that stuff. But that's pretty well the limitation of, of the project on this. And it looks like from what it shows in the paperwork that we're looking through December of 2021 for completion of this? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Uh I'll just go back to the top. Billy, do you have any comments or questions? Um, yeah, I do. Um, I guess um, I just preface it by saying I'm um, just in, in these small mountain towns. You know, in 35 years I've been out west here. Um, I always felt like I've come to feel that uh, sidewalks and paved roads are kind of the gateway drug for these towns going down the wrong path. Um, and just be kind of, you know, on their way to not being affordable and not being the same kind of town they used to be. So not a fan of sidewalks and roads in the first place, but um, I also do see the need for accessibility uh, for folks with disabil disabilities, which to me is also, I can see as important. Um, so yeah, I mean, so in general, you know, this project seems like it's well along the way. I was, I was, I personally was against that road improvement tax, but you know, I was on the, so, um, I'm the losing side of that vote. So, um, 
my only real question, though, I, I, I kind of echo Rogers with the materials for sidewalks, and then also it looks like things are really going to get cut. Jefferson Street, I wonder about parking along the west side. It's like a good way to go, but it does seem like parking might get um, inched on the west side of Jefferson Street. Um, he did freak up a little bit, really. but um, to your your question about the material, I'm not sure if there's a uh, a, a choice in the types of materials we can use. Um, there is specifications and criteria that meet what a multimodal sidewalk is, and. Mm -hmm. You know, a certain width, and I believe concrete is the main um, material for these types of sidewalks. Um, it is a conventional sidewalk that I am in favor of for for obvious reasons, and based on not only my personal um, feeling, but on input of the community and what we have existing with these permeable sidewalks that we have right now not really meeting the um, the criteria for ADA accessibility, which I agree is, is important in Netherlands. Um, however, I did have feedback from SAB about, or rather, I think it was ProSAB about, um, you know, maybe there's materials of recycled rubber and, and all this. I don't know if that's possible. Um, again, I prefer uh, a concrete sidewalk that has longevity and that um, truly is a surface that will accommodate ADA accessibility. So um, that's really where I stand on it. Yeah, I mean, I guess my... Bill, Billy, makes... I just want, wanted to make a comment. This is Karen Garrity. Um, I did just want to say that um, I, we appreciate where you're coming from about you know, hard surfaces and concrete and whatnot. And really what this project is trying to do, it, what it wants to do, the intention, is to make it possible for people with mobility issues. So people in wheelchairs, for instance, there, if you look at the RTD parking parking ride right now, the way it is designed and the way that the sidewalks come into it, it is really impossible for uh, somebody who is in a wheelchair to navigate safely out of the RTD parking lot going almost anywhere. But then if they're wanting to come down West 1st Street, it gets even more dangerous and if that person wants to get to downtown to shop or to the bank or town hall to you know whatever it, it is not at all um mobile friendly for anyone who has a wheelchair uses a cane as a walker um so so i just want to say that because i want to recognize what you've said as well um this is certainly not an effort to you know, increase property values or change the economic, you know, landscape of the town. It's really about getting people safely from one place to another who are who have um, alternative mobility needs. So I just wanted to address that, and I want to thank you for your uh, position. Well, yeah, and I appreciate. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Um, perspective and I do you know whereas for accessibility I do that's where I do feel you know, like you know that that's extremely important um I do you know I, I do yeah I do hold to that pavement is the gateway drug for these towns to go down the wrong road but um I also um talk about our, our long-term sustainability goal at zero I just want to keep in mind that the carbon footprint of things like you know versus well the carbon foot concrete you know it's it's it some of is we're going towards net zero like buying renewable energy credits you know for solar i mean we're, we're kind of greenwashing you know are we really you know being those sustainability goals or just kind of dancing around in a way to meet them well i will i will just add that the one thing that could be considered to make concrete greener if that's possible, 
is to add a higher concentration of fly ash to the concrete. Yeah, yeah, I know. Which would help. I mean, again, I, I get your point of greenwashing, but every little bit does help when it comes to this kind of infrastructure. Yeah, fly ash can be pretty good for pigment versus shrub green. Hey, uh, uh, people, uh, Billy, uh, Chris, We'll just go on and on here. So if we could actually kind of focus in on on kind of questions and your comments, and let's get Chris some bullets, some ideas. Okay. To Park, try to take parking on the I mean, uh, global hunger, okay? I think that's what we're doing. So, Billy, yeah, go ahead and tell us what, you know, your particular need to want to uh, speak to. Okay, part just just – Parking in Street, on the west side. Going to be tight with the sidewalk, bigger sidewalk. I agree, and that's one of the thoughts that um, you're having with maybe um, not having a flow of traffic that has um, two-way traffic on Jefferson. Maybe one-way traffic makes more sense and will reduce congestion and help... Um, uh, better direct the flow of traffic through downtown um, and have more control over how traffic drives around there. So maybe re changing the flow and only having one-way traffic would offer more room for parked cars and, um, and make it a little safer. So that's one thought that staff had. Anything else, Billy? No, we'll tackle global hunger next month, Roger. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I apologize if I was doing that way, but somehow it was kind of getting into just a, a you know a longer discussion as to you know really giving Chris bullets that we needed. So, Linda Glasser, your comments, please. Um, I have a question also on the parking in front of Catman. Do would the sidewalk go in front or behind the parking? So would the parking be directly in front of their building or the sidewalk? Directly in front of their building, and it would align with the existing sidewalk in front of the plaza. The Kathmandu Plaza um, to the north of their restaurant is essentially right on the, um, the right-of-way property line. So if you kind of cite that down, you can see right. um, that's kind of where the border of town property is. And the crosswalk from RTD towards, um, as you would be walking down towards Kathmandu, but that would be a crosswalk where um, the, the road is there, as well as in front of... Uh, as you're going down to the, the town hall, when you cross each road, is that just a crosswalk or what kind of um, crosswalk? What kind of walkway would that be? It's it's a typical crosswalk, but there again, that's where maybe we could make um, changes within the design. So, for example, it could be a raised sidewalk, so it's really prominent. Um, was one thought to uh, sort of slow traffic down. It's not a speed bump, but a raised sidewalk that just better promotes um, pedestrian traffic rather than vehicle traffic. Just one example. And people, it would be more aware of that being a crosswalk. Yes. Yeah. I think those were my questions. That was it. Uh all right, Chris Prey, are you there? Let's see if we can get Chris there on the phone. I'm probably going to have to to translate for him, but Chris, go ahead. Oh, I didn't see any of this paperwork or anything like that, so I'd like to see the paperwork and I'll get back to Chris on it. Okay, Chris I said he wants to review the PowerPoint and then get back to Chris with his feedback. Okay, uh, Karen Blackmore, welcome aboard, Karen. Good to see you again. Hi. Thank you. Good to see all of you. Um, the last name is Blakemore. 
Blackmore is a common mistake. Um, oh, again, yes. Okay. So I was looking at the grant application today, and I saw that it differed from uh, what is presented in the PowerPoint in two areas. One is um, financially, and the other one is scope. And so I'm trying to understand um, the difference there in what the requirements are in terms of functionality. Um, so the requested grant amount was 2185000 with match of 115000 which is 5%, 46000 from the town and 69000 from DDA, for a total of project cost of $2.3 million. And that included sidewalks, charging stations, bike corrals, reconstructed roadways. Uh, Karen, Karen, can I address what happened? Yeah, what happened is we, is we went through this two-year process with CDOT and Dr. Cog, and all along we had asked for improvements on Jefferson Street and First Street and the uh, par parking lot, the visitor center parking lot. We had representatives at all these meetings from CDOT and Dr. Cog. We even had them reviewing our grant application, and we were told all along it was a strong application. It was great. It, it was really looking good, blah, blah, blah. It it wasn't until after we submitted the grant application when we were having another one of our meetings. And again, CDOT is there and Dr. Cog and CDOT staff realized that the application, the funds could not be used for a road that is not a CDOT road. So we had put all this time and effort in this project which uh, we had introduced to them, including these roads. So I am sure you can imagine how can how upset uh, and frustrated Chris and I were. And actually, you know, CDOT and Dr. Cog, they were very apologetic. But they're the ones who helped us massage this, take out the roads, uh, lower the amount, but they also lowered the amount that was actually required. They did that just for us as a match because they realized what a hardship this was since we had gone through this entire process, had vetted it with the community, had talked to the board of trustees about it, had put it in the newspaper. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It, so, yeah, it, it, what, it's unfortunate that what we actually thought and were told uh, we could apply for in this grant ended up after we applied for it uh, being recognized that we couldn't. So that's when we asked, went back to the DDA, asked for some more money so that they could basically give us enough money that we could handle the Jefferson Street uh, improvements and the visitor center improvements outside the scope of the project because it couldn't be included. So that's why you're seeing those big differences. Uh, okay, so, so the, the scope difference is that uh, the reconstructed roadways, Jefferson Street and West First Street, and the improved visitor center parking uh, is no longer part of the project. Is that right? The actual repairs to the road surface, that's correct. Uh, okay. Chris, I don't know if you want to talk about the details of the things that can be improved um, that are allowed with the funds. <laughs> Specifically within this program and this awarded project, that's correct. Um, but the project as a whole, as sort of a, um, a parallel project to this, will still include reconstruction and or at least improvements to Jefferson Street and the Visitor Center parking lot, um, but they just can't be within the funding of this project. Just for clarity. Oh, okay, and and so uh, the match was reduced from five percent to something lower than five percent. Is that right? Yes, they just asked for fifty thousand for the entire project for one point five million dollar project. Okay, and that comes from the town, from the street. Yeah, that, that's right. The one hundred and thirty nine thousand from DDA is. Um, not within the scope of this grant project. 
That's a, well, so it's cool. not considered part of the grant, but we are going to be doing that along with this project. Okay. Funded by, yeah, funded by the DDA, and then if we need to throw in some more money from the um, road project, you know, that's a possibility uh, for the road, road funds. That's a possibility, uh, but mm -hmm. we're hoping to just stay within the amount of money that the DDA gave us. It would be really good to have that all documented so that... Um, we actually do, but, but we must not have shared it appropriately. Okay. Yeah, this, this was all handled in public meetings with the Board of Trustee, Trustees mm -hmm. as this went down. Okay. Um, so I don't know, Chris, if that's something that you could send to the, um, to the Planning Commission if you've got access to that easily or... Yeah, I, I probably do. I, I don't remember if I have an, an updated application. I feel like I must. Um, no, because they didn't make us actually do an updated application. We um, we had to uh, present to the Board of Trustees, and that's where we explained all of this and outlined the changes to what would be handled by by the grant and then what would be handled by the funds from the DDA? It's certainly recorded publicly in oh, multiple yeah. meetings in the BOT, in the DDA, well, um, just, as we went through this process. I, I just think as a project, it would be great to have like a project plan that w was really clear about the financials, um, where the money's coming from, what part is the grant, what the matching part is, um, what improvements will be made um, as part of the grant money, and um, we'll, we'll get that to you, Karen. And we'll okay. we'll send it to the whole planning commission because okay. we do have it. Um, um, it just wasn't included in the packet. Okay, to, uh, just a couple. And, then, and let me also add to that, Karen. Uh, yes, um, it sounds to me like that would be a great piece to add into the OPR as well. Okay. Um, a, a couple other quick comments. Um, the admin cost of $245,000 seems high. Um, so uh, I was uh, assuming that the 139000 was part of the um, grant project um, and using a total of um, one million six hundred eighty-nine thousand as a total project cost. The admin cost would be fourteen point five percent, which seems high to me. Um, and That's fairly um, average for these types of um, federally funded grant projects. They just there is a lot of red tape and require a long process. And so um, the the funding is um, how we, how we um, budget the funding is, um, oh, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. It's basically, through CDOT's um, experience, those costs are, are pretty average. Okay. And then a recommendation that I have is to create a high-level budget that would um, uh, break down uh, costs by phase of the project and also by function as far as admin labor, material, sidewalk, by corrals, charging station. Um, I have that. Okay. Yeah, if that could be shared, um, that would be great. Yeah, I can share that. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, Karen. Um, <laughs> Stephanie, it's your turn. Are you still there? I am. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I guess I had a couple questions about the map. I was trying to sort out where the charging stations are actually going to be located. Can you clarify that for me? Yeah, so um, some of the input that we received from the BOT was to remove the charging stations from the center of the visitor center parking lot and move them over to the west end. And in this picture, you can kind of see a little red line. Yeah, there. I see that. Yeah, and that's where they're going to be located. And then a sidewalk connecting those charging stations to 
um, to the parking lot. Uh, so that's that's their their proposed new home. And how many are you talking about? Well, we had proposed four, um, and we are working to get other grant funds to um, to help support that cost. Like I said, I mean, one point five million is a lot of money, and to Karen's point, two hundred forty-five thousand just for admin. But these types of federal projects um, sort of balloon in cost when you get to this level. And it's not unheard of for these things to cost a lot of money. And so we are working on um, funds for for uh, the charging stations and particularly some of the input that we received from SAB to do um, fast chargers, um, which can charge a car in a much quicker amount of time, like 30 minutes. And those charging stations are, of course, cost more money than a typical generic charging station that may take four, three, four hours. So um, that's, does that answer it? It does. Um, I guess my only question around the charging stations was whether or not it made sense to actually have one at the RTD parking lot, um, given that there are people who may be commuting from, say, Gilpin County or other places and, you know, promoting this idea of like, hey, come to the bus station, charge your car while you're at work, come back um, to enhance potentially people who would consider getting an electric vehicle as part of their commute. Um, not just people who are here for visiting during the day, which is also obviously an important part of um, the, you know, having charging stations in the town. So I just was wondering if there would be consideration for having one at the RTD parking lot. Oh, um I'll pose that question. I'm not sure if we can expand, expand our project to outside the town's boundaries. Um, but I'll, I'll find out. And then the other complication to that is it does require infrastructure to support these charging stations. So transformers up sized appropriately to be able to accommodate um, chargers. And we wanted to size the infrastructure great enough that we could add some in the future if we wanted to. So um, to split that up and have, uh, you know, a, a transformer in one location, in multiple locations, would increase the cost. Um, so that's another consideration when it, when it comes to um, to adding these, these chargers. Um, but uh, I've added that to my list, and I'll see if that's a possibility. So I'm, I'm curious. I guess my other question was, um, I did see that little box, and so now I'm wondering, is there a cost associated with decommissioning the existing charging stations? Moving them? Yeah, there will be, but in, in order to to improve what we already have, we kind of need to replace the infrastructure anyway. So, okay. um, so it's really, it, it's probably for the best. Good way to update what we have and, and improve upon and make it better. And was the rationale for putting the charging stations within that town parking lot that it's primarily focused on day visitors who are coming to not only just tourists? Yes. It's one of the few places on the peak to peak highway where you can charge your car. And um, there's a term that uh, that, is, that is used. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it has something to do with um, charging fear. Something to that effect where people who own electric cars um, have an anxiety behind how far they can actually go. And so having this sort of stop point on the peak to peak highway will help encourage more um, usage of electric charging vehicles and promote visitors of that type of alternative transportation to the area. I think, I think it's good for Netherlands to have um, a charging station. To do, um, yeah, I just think my, my only comment there, I guess, is still whether we want to have one more convenient for commuters, which would be primarily um, beneficial to to locals and people who live in um, up here, whether it be peak to peak to you know to ward or wherever. Um, 
So that was one question. My other question was, along West First Street, as you do consider the parking, right now it's all pull-in parking. Um, so it, the cars are perpendicular to the road. With this new model, would you be then making cars parallel to the road, given the space constraints? Well, actually, the, car, no, go ahead, on the, the cars that park on the south side of the road are parallel parking. Yeah, so I meant on the Kathmandu side. The business side. On Jefferson Street. Um, no, I no on, we, on West First Street. So right now on West First Street, um, on that side, that the narrow side of Kathmandu, there is pull-in parking there for the business. Oh, and I see. If yes. there's park, yeah. So if there's if there's a sidewalk that goes in um, where that purple line is on West First Street, um, would that current pull-in business parking become parallel parking so you go from whatever there are now like like four to five spots there to maybe you know two to three at the most i'm just kind of curious as to if that's going to be parallel parking now yeah that's a good observation and yes likely it would be parallel parking to accommodate the width of the sidewalk and then to meet netherlands boundaries right there because i think the the right of way is a couple feet off the building of um katmandu and I'll know clearly once we get a survey. But again, another thought is that if we change the flow of traffic, if we have perpendicular parking on the south side of West First Street and really increase parking significantly the full length of West First Street, because the town's right of way is actually quite big there. And if you look at, and we could utilize it more efficiently. And if you look at, say, the um, the real estate business that's there right now, in front of their building is actually almost in the right of way. Mm -hmm. And their steps probably are in the right of way. So that full length and all the parking that's there could be reconfigured and used more efficiently um, and could possibly add um, perpendicular parking. And I think that this could be a, a concept or sort of a, an optional design that could be presented in the future as we make decisions on the final design here of what, you know, and after a survey, what it would look like. Can we actually fit perpendicular parking on West First Street? And is that, is that something that's desired from the various boards in the community? So it is something to think about, but yes. Um, chances are on the north side that parking will turn into parallel parking. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I guess my other question then was when you talk about the purple line in front of um, the town hall and the cafe, there is a sidewalk there. So this is talking about tearing that sidewalk out and refurnishing it or... Um, what's what's the purple line they're referring to? Yes, it'd be reconstructing that sidewalk. Okay. It's, it's a, a beat up old sidewalk that um, needs improvements, and um, and it does not meet multimodal uh, requirements. And the only place really where there's appropriate ramps for ADA accessibility is actually where it meets the highway on two thousand on um. Um, on 119, and then it just sort of turns to dirt over there and runs into the street on the uh, the west side over by Neds, for example. So all of that would be reconstructed and improved. I see. Um, that's all. Thank you for clarifying um, the elements here. I think that, yeah, my main comment would be, one, I support a lot of things that I've heard already, so I wanted to focus my comments on things that were different. Um, but definitely the electric charging stations, uh, just trying to get a sense of what the reasoning was for having them there. Um, and it sounds like, like you said, you're, you're more interested in supporting the day traffic, you know, people who are coming to town as visitors versus people who live here um, and may use it for commuting purposes. So I guess I'd propose that, you know, that you get some level of consideration. Um, I guess my other question is if you had charging stations at the RTD parking lot, given that we already see so much overflow parking at the RTD parking lot, could it be multi-use, right? Because that means the charging stations right now would presumably get more use on the weekends 
Um, whereas if they were at the RTD parking lot and being used by commuters, um, then you know people who are traveling here in electric vehicles to to shop for the weekend or just come into town to visit, maybe it could be a, a dual use type of thing. But certainly for commuters, it would need to be closer, I think, to the actual bus station for it to be um, to be potentially useful. So just a thought. I'd be interested to know what your your planning team is to think about that. Um, the bike corrals, I actually think those are generally pretty good locations. It'll be nice to see some improvement in the bike um, situation at the actual RTD parking lot. Um, in terms of what do you mean by corral, are you talking about the kinds of corrals you see in Boulder where the stations are, you know, covered and locked or are these really just, you know, in the ground metal posts that people can lock their bikes to? I envision in the, in the ground metal posts, but um, I'm open to other concepts. I, I really don't, I haven't researched much in the way of what a bike corral looks like. Um, I'm not sure if I'm using the right terminology when I say that. Uh, I'm not really familiar with, honestly, bike infrastructure. Um, so I, I guess I, I can't clearly answer your question. Um. Yeah, so if you, I don't know if you're familiar with what RTD does, or I guess it's the Boulder County system works in Boulder, but you can get, and I have one of these because I work in Boulder and I can in Boulder on my bike, um, is you can get a key card to their locked bike stations. Uh, so as a, you can you can only get into the bike area if you have one of these key cards. And so it helps reduce, I think, issues of bike theft. They're covered, so in the wintertime, you don't have to worry about getting showing up in your bike being covered in snow or rain. Um, I don't necessarily think it's something we need up here, but when you said corral, I just wasn't sure what you guys were planning. So um, it'd be helpful to have a little bit of clarity on whether you're talking about a covered um, bike thing or just posts in the ground. I actually think both posts in the ground are probably fine for Netherland. <laughs> I don't think it's the same kind of traffic that um, Boulder does. I wasn't trying to advocate for that, but just trying to get clarity on um, what, your, what the plan was. Okay, that's good to know. And then to your point about the visitor center parking lot, I mean, as the name implies, we really want to promote that parking area for more visitors and gear towards visitors and, and not really be overflow parking. So I hear you on, on that point. And then um, I really was envisioning just sort of posts in the ground or some, some variation of that. Um, so I wasn't really aware that a bike corral was like a, a covered facility. Um, and I, I kind of agree with you that that's probably not something Netherland needs. However, there are people that would like to have their bike covered. So, um, Cynthia's raising her hand. Yeah, I mean, the other, you know, <laughs> that's who I was there's thinking a lot about. of varieties, right? There's posts in the ground, which is, you know, I, I live close enough that that's probably fine for someone like me. But you're right. I mean, for people who are coming from further away, they also have lock boxes. So you can put your bike into a small box and lock it for the day. With a lot of sense of security. They can put other things in there, like clothes when they, you know, people who are bike commuters. So given that, I think especially for the RTD one um, and the fact that that would probably be more used by commuters than the one next to Ned's, which I could see being used for more, you know, downtown traffic to go have lunch somewhere. Um, the commuting one in particular, I can see potentially wanting to invest in something that is makes it more friendly for bikers. So just something to consider. It would promote people then, then of course, also using the bus to travel to Boulder instead of having an SOV down the canyon. Okay. I would only add, Chris, that aside from wind, snow, and rain, which is great up here, um, the UV radiation just tears apart the rubber on bikes and other things. That's why I like to cover my bike. So I usually cover it at home with a tarp or try to put it somewhere or, um, you know, put it in the shade. But that's a lot of why I try to, because it just burns down all of, um, you know, pretty much everything. So, yeah, no, it's, it's true. And those bike lockers are actually, I think, quite um, a good option. And you see those all over in Boulder as well. Not just the, it's not a full covered station. It's just a bike locker. And I think I don't use mine for them or you pay for them or whatever. But um they are, uh, I think they're another great option that we could potentially consider in Netherland. Those are great because I just haul all my stuff. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That it, Stephanie? That's your comment, Stephanie? Yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. I, 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 like I said, I concur with the comments that were made earlier. I just didn't want to repeat them all. <laughs> okay. Thanks. We got a couple more. We got Chris and 
Steve, myself, and Julian then. So Chris Bray, is Chris? Well, he said he was going to provide his comments oh, oh. separately, I think. Was that right? It was separately? Oh, yes, correct. He's going to contact Chris Pelletier separately. Okay, fantastic. That brings us to Steve, Vice Chair. Steve. Okay. Um, most of my questions have been answered, I believe. Um, so I had questions on the material. Uh, how uh, how wide are these uh, sidewalks going to be? I believe they're eight foot. Eight foot. Okay. Um, and there, uh, did you say earlier though that they won't be the same material as the existing sidewalks already? They'd, they'd be uh, hopefully like you you were thinking concrete. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. So follow up on um, Stephanie's comment. I really like the idea of having charging stations, you know, close to the RTD. Is this, do you think this is something that RTD could help pay for? Because I noticed a lot of charging stations going into parking rides, RTD parking rides, and I'm pretty sure that uh, they must be paying for them. So I don't know whether uh, this is something we can approach RTD on or something to, so that you could have charging stations kind of at both ends. I'll reach out to RTD and see what kind of funding they have to support that type of infrastructure in their in their parking lot. Um, yeah, I think it's worth following up on just to see because that way we may be able to, um, you know, get more uh, charging stations. And with regard to the charging station, I'm sort of curious. I don't know too much about the maintenance or how much it costs to run those. Uh, I am assuming this will be a town cost after this project is done, uh, that that we just pay for the maintenance and also the uh, electricity. Is that right? Um, no, I, I would like to have them be um, a fee-based. We pay for the... Well, I'm not even sure about paying for the... Um, the maintenance of, because sometimes you can work that out with the provider as part of the fee, but I'd like them to be fee-based. Okay. Yeah, because I know like Tesla, for example, puts in uh, charging stations that are free, but they pick up the cost on it and everything. So I don't know how that program works or, or um, whether they could be approached as well. But uh, I do know that I've seen a lot of they put their little ad up and everything, but um, I was sort of curious the operation of those. So when you say fee based, you mean it would be like a credit card thing? That's uh, what I envision. Okay. Um, let's see what else do I have. Oh, uh, follow up on uh, Linda's question about the sidewalk in front of the uh, old Katmandu. So if it were to be a restaurant in the future. You know, and they wanted to do like outdoor seating. Um, how would we do that with the sidewalk that would probably run between the uh, between the restaurant? Let's just call it a restaurant and the uh, outdoor seating. It would actually align with their outdoor seating, so it wouldn't affect their existing outdoor seating. Now, but the sidewalk would essentially abut right up to it. If their outdoor seating is exactly within their property, right up to the edge of the right of way. Okay, so it would be it would be on the east side of the sidewalk. Is that right? Or not? Out, the sidewalk would be on the east side of okay. their outdoor seating, or their outdoor seating would be west of the sidewalk. The sidewalk right. Okay, all right. Yeah, I wasn't. Um, I wasn't quite clear on how close it came to you envisioning coming to the restaurant itself. So, so it would be away from the, um, you know, from the building by, I don't know what, six feet or whatever their current um, seating is, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And that's continuing, that's going to be the Kamandu restaurant, Steve. So that's not going to change. Um, okay. They're in a they're in an interior remodel, and they're going to pop that up to have the apartments above. And that was approved, golly, like 12, 11 or twelve, I think, prior to my uh, time coming with the town. 
Um, so it is going to be the Kathmandu. They're just temporarily down First Street in that location while they're doing the construction so they could continue their operations, which made a lot of people happy who were very sad to see the Kathmandu be closed right now. Yeah, that's right. And I wasn't quite sure what was going on there. So thanks for that uh, clarification. Uh, let's see. Um, the, uh, okay, that one's answered. That one's, oh, um, so the, the crossing on Highway 72 with, you know, that um, right by the um, uh, church there and where the two blue lines come across, is there going to be any kind of a, like a pedestrian traffic control system there? You know, something like where you push the button or, um, or some type of a light that's going to stop traffic? Or do you just, people in... Uh, just kind of take their chances crossing there. Not as part of this project. However, that could be um, a request of, um, made to CDOT to improve that crossing. And we wouldn't do that until after the, um, the Boulder County has finished their project and a, a proper traffic study can be done based on the, the flow and the conditions um, that are occurring after the, the, the project is complete and it's full. So, and that has been considered and talked about um, on a staff level, but we wouldn't be able to really bring that to ask CDOT until after that. But that's not a part of this project. Okay, well, I just flag it as uh, something that probably should be pursued. I mean, I have no problem with with crossings of the, you know, the smaller streets, like on the purple uh, lines and everything, like you mentioned, maybe a raised sidewalk or at least painted or whatever. But crossing a, a very busy highway is a totally different animal. Agreed. But so, yeah, it's the well, library right there. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, and then my other comment was, again, I was concerned about the parking and how things were going to change with regard to losing parking um, with an eight-foot um, sidewalk. So that was my only other concern. So I think everything else has been that I had on my list has been talked about. Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh, Julian Taylor, are you still there? Welcome aboard. Oh, I'm still here. Um, so, Chris, I, I, my concern about the high-speed charger kind of comes and goes. I get nervous about it, and then I, I manage to uh, get myself feeling better. Uh, hopefully, we will deal with that. Um, we will deal with that over time. It's just that uh, high-speed chargers are used for a completely different purpose than low-speed chargers. The people who are going to be using that high-speed charger will likely be people who are on road trips. And they know about the high-speed charger because their car told them about it when it gave them the plan for their trip. And so the issue, I was originally thinking the high-speed charger was a problem for one reason. My other concern now is that having one high-speed charger is a real problem because it takes about 30 minutes to run the high-speed charger to get you the next leg down the road. And so that's why Tesla always installs six or more chargers. It's so you don't have a long line that may last for two or three hours. But uh, uh, by the way, uh, Tesla chargers do charge for the use of their electricity. It's just that it all happens without a credit card. It's uh, all automated. Um, other than that, everything looks good. So um, high-speed charger, a little nervous. But uh, for everything else, it looks very good. So that's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Um, I think I've got everybody except for my final comments. So I'll be very brief. Um, everything's been covered. I'll just emphasize. Uh, I agree that we should not be losing as many any parking spaces. So be aware of the parking spaces. Um, and Billy, I kind of agree with you though, with all the red tape and how much of a big project this is, I feel your pain. So yes, this has gotten to be, it's really, 
It's a very expensive project. Uh, Karen mentioned it too. There's it's close to 15% overhead just in the uh, engineering consultant fees. Uh, I just I, I know we'll do the best we can, but I, as usual, I, I, I just question the, when we're all said and done, it's going to be thousands of dollars a linear foot for sidewalk. Uh, so it's just a comment, really. Um, and about the high-speed charging, I think we're actually missing the boat. It actually should take a day to recharge, so people have to get their cars recharged, <laughs> go to restaurants, and probably even have to stay overnight. <laughs> I think I'm saying that a little tongue in cheek. Um, that was really it. And I want to emphasize, though, uh, Stephanie's point about charging stations uh, one way or the other in RTD lot would be very appropriate. And Steve's comment there on the highway of uh, getting a, cro a crosswalk there is actually the uh, sidewalk into the library. And you do actually see people that are often trying to cross the road there, going to the library. So whether in this project or next project, uh, the uh, charging stations and the crosswalk there in front of the library is something that actually should be in the plan. You know, something needs to be planned. So uh, that's my comment. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you got what you need? Does that work out? Uh, uh, Karen, uh, Garrity, are we, think we got enough feedback for staff? Uh, sure. Uh, do you feel the same, Chris? And lots of good feedback there. Yeah, yeah, that was great. I appreciate all the feedback um, um, from the board and I'll incorporate these comments as we make our plans and um, create the OTR. And then I'll bam back before uh, you guys again. And the OPR is in close to a final stage for further comment. And Chris, will you also be sure to share the revised uh, project uh, as Karen Blakemore requested so um, everyone can see how the uh, project had to be adjusted based on the discovery that we could not use those funds to repair the roads? Yes. I did look at the uh, minutes from that BOT conversation and unfortunately the minutes don't include any of the conversation. So um, I apologize for that, but we will get you the, um, the information, Karen, and everybody. And, and I'm assuming Deputy members have any additional comments? They just send them to you, Chris, and maybe Karen. Well, Chris suggested that you um, copy okay. in Roger as well, so okay. that he's he's aware of what information is being exchanged. Or we send it all to Roger, yeah. well, and then he can we can we send it to Cynthia? I mean, that would be a focused, correlated area there, right? To Cynthia, that anybody has additional comments. I mean, I think that may, then we don't get it into, although this is not quasi judicial, but just to have that practice of sending it to town hall um, as a central sure. email. Sure, you could send it to Chris and Cynthia. You can include me if you want, Miranda, you bet. Okay. We're happy to collect that information. Let's do that. Let's do it that way. Um, Okay, well then, if that wraps up that item, uh, then we'll just move to the uh, the next discussion. I have the vision 2030, and Miranda was going to introduce that. Yep. So the Board of Trustees is, is ready. We originally, our goal was to embark on Envision 2030 back in March, but because of COVID, things got a little delayed, um, but we're ready to pick it back up. And what we're doing is we're focusing the next uh, few months on soliciting feedback from internal and external stakeholders. So the Planning Commission is the first. Um, what we're asking of you tonight is to address these questions that we have before you. 
To clarify though, it's specifically as they relate to the planning commission. You all will have an opportunity to speak about strengths and weaknesses of town as a whole, but tonight we're just asking you to talk about the planning commission. So Roger, what I'd like to do is do this in three rounds. Um, do first a round of strengths, then a round of weaknesses, and then a round of opportunities and threats. Um, and then just ask that the commissioners, you don't have to answer every question, but maybe speak to the questions we have listed here. Um, so Roger, is that okay with you to do it that way? Yeah, yes, I, you're, you're in control, but okay. I agree 100%. My only other thought is though, just as we just finished up the other discussion item though, is that I mean, having this communication here and, and, and maybe a little brainstorming without going into a lot of detail, but I, I believe even more so in this item that we actually should be just sending you some good email that that we will correlate and have a really, really good packet of, of emails because it's something that each person can sit down there. I mean, I, certainly for myself, sitting there in my uh, office and... and writing things down and, you know, and then would be for me the way I would want it to but we certainly should go we could do a discussion right now I mean if that's uh, if that's so what, what is your feedback to that I was gonna say if that's what the commission um agrees to I'm also fine with obtaining that information one-to-one -one, and you just all send me an individual email answering the questions we have outlined if you feel like that's more appropriate to allow people time to research and and give the answers I'm totally fine with that. All right. Well, then well, let's just go down and pull the uh, the the group. Then uh, Steve, would you like to have a long discussion tonight, or do you think we ought to individually email uh, I, Miranda? I, I sort of think we should start with uh, emailing, and then maybe we could have a discussion at a future meeting with the planning commission to kind of go over all the input and. And it might trigger some other thoughts people might have. Um, so kind of, I'm thinking sort of like a two-step process. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Linda Glasser, what's your feelings on this project and getting it started? Oh, I think Linda? I had her muted hold on. Linda, are you there? Hello? Yeah, you're good. I had you muted because there was some background noise. Go ahead. Linda? Yes. Okay. Did you hear Roger's question? Um, he wanted, I, and what I was saying was I agreed with what uh, Stephen was saying, that uh, we could maybe do this in a two-step process because other things will be coming out as we start discussing these. So for Miranda to have some of the emails on what our thoughts are and then discuss it from there. Jim Reese, what's your feeling? I concur. I think that uh, this would be good to to send in uh, email answers to these and then have a future discussion on uh, on all of it. Stephanie, your feelings? Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that if you want a two-step process, it's fine versus trying to do it all by verbal discussion tonight. Uh, Karen Blakemore? Ditto. Same. Yeah, I agree okay. with the, Steve's proposal. Uh, would I, I guess Chris Bray, can we get an answer from Chris? Chris, what is your feeling? Table it for now. Give us the questions. Let us answer the questions and we'll look at it in another meeting. He said table it for now. Send send the questions and then hopefully be able to meet face to face when we have that round two to discuss them. Okay. Um uh, I got Julian. Do you have any comments, Julian? To we'll, we should at least hear you, get your feedback as a BOT member. Well, I'm doing it mostly through the BOT, but I certainly think Stephen's uh, proposal sounds uh, good. 
Okay. Well, then we we, we should do that. Billy. Oh, Billy, I'm sorry. Thank you, Billy. No problem. I, I do agree with Steve's proposal. Good idea. Yeah, we've done at, at NCAR, we've done a lot of these SWOT analysis this way, and they've worked out very, very well uh, in the past. So that's where my recommendation came from. No, that's great. Okay. I mean, you guys are our first round. So what I'll do is I'll send out an email um, with a time frame that I'll ask for these back just so I have time to compile the information and then we can discuss it at a future meeting. Perfect. Cool. Right. Thank you. You may want to just, if, if you just have a general discussion at this point, or you're on a wait. Um, I think it would almost be redundant. Then let's get everybody other thoughts, and then we'll have a, okay. a really, really good. Uh, everybody will have some very good thoughts, and and we can have a discussion, and plus everybody will be able to see and read everyone's input as yeah. as we prepare for that discussion. So that would be almost. If that, I think that would be a big advantage too to have a, a real good list of all the input. Yeah, you wouldn't have names attached. You yeah. just have like a list of responses. We could do that. Yep, I can do that. I guess you know we are hoping to get the feedback between really July and August. Um, so I'll work with Cynthia depending on what the agenda looks like in July. If if it's not too busy, maybe we'll sneak it into that discussion. Otherwise, we can postpone it to August. I think that'd be great, but I, at least, at least as far as all the commissioners giving the input to you, uh, I don't see how that, why that should be delayed. We can all do our homework and at least get that to you. And then you'll be able to schedule whenever there, when, whenever you can. Yep. But I, you know, I would think the next two weeks, certainly, and if we can, you know, for the commissioners give staff the feedback for these, uh, three areas. That you're, that you're asking. And I think they're actually very good. Uh, the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities, I think that's a good outline that you provided. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I guess my ask would be to get the feedback by July 10th, which is a, basically a little over two and a half weeks. It's a Friday. I'll send that out, though, in an email. Okay. Thank okay. you, Miranda. Thank Fantastic. you. Okay. Um, that was a good way to move that that part of the agenda on so is there any other business staff does anybody else have other business if not then you get a motion to adjourn motion to adjourn i make chris, a motion yeah. to adjourn the meeting chris Prey actually just made it but i was muted he beat you linda he was first <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> all right linda he seconds it all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. Thank you very much for coming, uh, get, getting together again this fall. You think we'll be in person next month? I th think we're going to play it by ear. We're going to see how it goes. And I know some boards and commissions may try to meet in person. And so we'll let them be the guinea pigs. And I, see. I see Karen shaking her head. So. <laughs> yeah. Now, I won't be, but I can email my comments or Alan or whatever. Thank you, Karen. All right, thank you, everybody. Roger, did you want did you want Cynthia and I to hang on for, or were we done? Um, it's up sort of up to Cynthia. I think I Goodbye, she Chris needs Ray. to finish up done. some of that conversation just to clarify. Okay, talk, but talk to you I later. think I gave her the feedback. Bye. But we can certainly go over it again. Oh, we wouldn't hurt. Yeah, Cynthia. Yeah, do you want to hang out with your? Yeah, that would be helpful, but let me just say one last thing. Planning Commission meeting is adjourned at 8.45 p.m.